What makes animation so special? Is it the elegant simplicity? The bright colors? The creative freedom to show impossible feats and alien creatures? That could be a part of it, but it doesn't explain why so many animated films are simply down-to-earth character dramas. We now have live-action movies that show impossible things with a blend of hyper-realistic CGI. And while the popularity of 3D animation has definitely overtaken traditional 2D drawings, the fact is, animated films are still around, and they aren't all trying to look real. The clue, I think, to this intangible specialness is the association of animation and youth. Before we're beaten into conformist shape by an uncaring machine that prohibits fun, the simplicity of a cartoon frame stimulates our minds by leaving the rest to imagination. When a robot, alien, and you all appear equally real, it empowers you to empathize with those unlike yourself. If science fiction is the domain of allegories that reflect on social issues, then animation is the accessible children's version of those allegories. So that's where we're going to start. First on the agenda, Futurama. Insane in the Mainframe is a 2001 episode of sci-fi satire Futurama, Season 3, Episode 12. In this episode, the transplanted from the past Philip Fry and his robot friend Bender get caught up in a bank robbery orchestrated by the crazy knife-loving Roberto. Fry and Bender get tried in criminal court and found guilty of being insane. Bender is sent to a psychiatric prison for robots, and Fry also goes to the same robot prison. Mr. Fry, I sentence you to the Home for Criminally Insane Humans. Your Honor, that facility has been full ever since you ruled that being poor is a mental illness. Just send them both to the robot loony bin and let's go. This is the turning point for the episode's main story, or the A-plot if you're into screenwriter lingo, Fry's experience as a human in a robot prison. It's also where the cracks start to show in this insightful social commentary. You see, Futurama has a tendency to flirt with social issues, but then abandon them for the sake of the episode's future gag, or for a cheap one-liner. The recurring example is the sewer mutants. The sewers are the slums, and their inhabitants the oppressed lower class. Yet all the jokes, including those from the mutants' perspectives, are about how ugly they are. In this episode, we find a backdrop of social commentary in the prison and the abuses it commits against Fry. Visual gags make reference to strip search, lobotomy, and electroconvulsive therapy. But that's all they are, little inconsequential jokes tossed in by the animator. There's a very overt reference to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, a robot Nurse Ratchet, who does one thing and is of no consequence thereafter. Bender plays somewhat of a McMurphy role, having fun with his personas and acting mad on purpose. Fry, on the other hand, insists that he doesn't belong there, leading to the best line of the episode. You were admitted to this robot asylum, therefore you must be a robot. That humorous construction of absurd troll logic is also uncomfortably true to real life. No one in a psychiatric prison really gets any evaluation of anything. You happen to be here, therefore, you belong here. At the same time, it kind of misses the point. There shouldn't be any score you could get on a test that makes your existence illegal. Yet Futurama seems more interested in falling right in line with the mainstream perspective that some people deserve it. Among those framed as falsely convicted, we have Norm, who is right about picking up radio transmissions from the CIA and shouldn't be deemed mad because he's right. Frankie, who is right about being a lunch worker and shouldn't be deemed mad because he's right. And Fry, who is right about himself being human and shouldn't be deemed mad because he's right. Hey, did we forget about the part where Fry is not only innocent of being a robot, but also of the crime he was originally tried for? 
Rather than leaning in to the dark comedy of institution life, the writers pull their punches. They undercut any moral by focusing on the error that a human was sent to a robot asylum. As if sending Fry to a psychiatric prison for humans would be just fine and dandy? You know, it's kind of like in real life, when a trans woman gets put in a male prison, and instead of saying anything about confinement, restraint, seclusion, forced druggy, strip searching, electroshock, the solution that liberals jump to is, hey, you should restrain, seclude, drug strip, and shock her in a women's prison. Problem solved. I do appreciate seeing that, much like in Cuckoo's Nest, it is the experience of the mental health system that actually drives our prisoner mad. I just wish I could see a character already hearing voices or having big moods or actually being multiple characters and still getting by just fine until psychiatry intervenes. Roberto does not scratch that itch. He's contrasted with Fry and Bender as being actually insane. He's one of the violent ones, who inevitably end up as farcical caricatures, not because it's a comedy show, but because there is no real-life counterpart to base them on. Presumably, we're supposed to accept violent Madbot Roberto as justification for why societies need psychiatric prisons, despite the writer admitting just a minute ago that those prisons commit atrocities against their prisoners and really have nothing to do with rehabilitation any more than mainstream prisons do. Roberto ends up Fry's convenient new cellmate, but not a moment too soon, Fry jumps through a time portal in the commercial break and is released, having been cured of his delusions of humanity. Once again, we have an opportunity to lean into dark comedy by addressing Fry's post-traumatic stress. We could have seen a joke about a box of donuts frightening him by resembling the medication discs, or uh, an awkward logistic puzzle sending him and Bender on a delivery mission when he can't be around robots anymore. All the while, Bender accuses him of being robo-racist. Instead, none of those things happen. Instead, the only thing wrong with Fry is that he thinks he's a robot, and the butt of every joke is that he tries to do robot things, but is too weak and stupid because he's Fry. There's a bit of a have-cake-and-eat-it-too problem going on here. Let me illustrate by example. A microcosm of it can be found in the same episode. The professor makes a sexist joke, and Amy slaps him for it. It's easy to imagine how this may have played out in the writer's room. Dude, what if Layla says that thing about being a woman, and then someone tells her to do his laundry? <laughs> oh yeah, that's so funny. But wait, isn't that really sexist? Won't people think we're sexist for putting that in? Nah, bro, we'll just have another character slap him for saying it. The problem here is, okay, you lampshaded the comment, but it was still commented. Someone had to write it, hand it to the voice actor, and keep it in the final cut. We know that real people did those things. And the lampshade really feels like an afterthought. Like, Amy doesn't even get a line, just an animation and a sound effect. There's a real possibility that Amy being in the shot at all was added extremely late in the process as a last minute save. The show wants to make sexist jokes, but not face any consequence for it. The show wants to have a plot where characters get arrested, sent to a psychiatric prison, and are different upon release. But this light and fluffy Sunday night serial can't get too deep lest the average viewer stop laughing at it, and everything has to reset by the end of the episode. So Fry gets snapped out of his delusion by a single piece of contrary evidence, and the story ends. Roberto reveals that his violent tendencies may be the result of childhood trauma, which is not remotely how that works, but okay, fine, I guess robots are different. And then instead of giving him any sort of catharsis or rehabilitation, it turns out to be a throwaway joke line. He literally exits the script by throwing himself out the window. The newer episodes kick him down even more. Bender's Game reveals that there's actually no reason for Roberto being the way he is. He's just programmed to be insane. He can't help it. He has the robot equivalent of a biological brain disease. Bender, like he does in most episodes, learns nothing. 
You can almost take that as a commentary in itself. Like, maybe this show is actually self-aware. Maybe the writers tried to do something real, but got censored. Bender is sprinkled throughout the episode as the willing psych patient. He thinks of the prison around him as a vacation, sees nothing wrong with how it's operated, and is blissfully unaware of the privileges he gets by holding this view. I like to think of Bender's attitude here as a stand-in for the audience, an observation made all the more accurate the less they realize it. I, of course, didn't realize it either, because I was like seven years old when this episode came out. And, because all the important satire is tucked away in one-liners and visual gags, while the main plot says something different. Futurama shows us horrible practices carried out in future prison, and the lesson we learn from the allegory should be, don't imprison people. But it's not. By leaning heavily on the false conviction trope, our focus is directed to the fact that our main character was misfiled, leading to a much weaker takeaway. Don't send your prisoners to the wrong prison. Phineas and Ferb Get Busted is a 2009 episode of, no surprise, Phineas and Ferb. Season 1, Episode 45. I didn't quite grow up with this show. I was in my teens when it came out, and closer to 20 when I actually saw it. Luckily, Phineas and Ferb is one of those children's shows written with the knowledge that adults may watch it too. Except in this case, it was accomplished by being clever, interesting, and fun, rather than by making coded sex jokes. There are lots of formulas driving this show. In most episodes, Phineas and Ferb build or invent some outlandish big thing, their older brother Kevin tries to show, Yes, his name is Kevin, the zebra can see his true self, that's why he calls him that, too late, it's canon now. Protect this beautiful trans boy. He tries to show the big thing to their mother Linda, but for some reason it disappears before mom arrives. And Perry the Platypus thwarts the latest evil scheme of Dr. Doofenshmirtz. Phineas and Ferb also has episodes that purposely defy the formula, and this is one of them. Kevin brings Linda to see the big thing, and it's still there. The boys are caught in the act. In response, Linda shares some disturbingly unhealthy attitudes towards her children and her role in parenting them, which I don't think the person who wrote the dialogue saw that way. She offers one serious objection to the tower being dangerous, but then her main concern seems to be that they didn't get her permission to build it. As if granting or denying permission isn't about the reasons behind it, but an end goal in itself. She also admits to collecting her older son's stories with a long-term goal to make fun of him in a stand-up comedy routine, and she only apologizes for it because he was right and she was wrong. Oh hey, it's like a motif, or maybe the writers grew up with the same cultural biases or something. In their anger, Lawrence and Linda send the boys away to a reformatory school, which, if you know the history of reformatories, is not actually a deceptive label. The Tri-State Penitentiary fake-out gag turns out to be not a fake-out after all. This is an act of paternalism. In the most literal sense of parents exercising unjustified legal power over their children, and also in the psychiatric sense of committing violence against a person, in this case imprisonment, supposedly in the victim's own best interest. I'm sorry, but this is really for your own good. PNF are, of course, children, somewhere between the age of 7 and 12, so some degree of parental patrol may be necessary. While I will say outright that 18 is the wrong arbitrary cutoff, exactly how young we should shift legal power is fuzzier and debatable. However, the portrayal of these inventors clearly isn't just as naive children, any more than secret agent Perry the Platypus is just a pet. So despite the artifice of character age, the depiction of a prison bus does ring true for captive adults as well. The Smile Away Reform School isn't a mental institution per se, rather it is stylized like a criminal prison and run by a military school drill sergeant. This was probably to be more relatable on account of our culture having established stereotypes of how prisons and armies are supposedly run. The parallels are not difficult to draw, though. You're imprisoned, not allowed to leave, you have to follow a rigid schedule, the goal is conformity, any original thought is severely punished, and all of this is allegedly for your own good. The episode hits a few prison and army tropes, like the pickaxes and the yelly drill sergeant, 
while also finding some notes of realism that seem as if they must have had psychiatry in mind. Most of the prisoners look like they're only following the rules because their spirits have been crushed. The overall theme is that Phineas and Ferb keep finding creative ways to subvert their instructions, which reminds me of my own institution experience, copying each other's attendance signatures to mess with the staff. What I found the most important commentary was over too soon. The boys are shown painting on canvas, but with everyone drawing identical boring squares. And that's... I just... Th there you go, reformists. There, there it is. There's the problem with art therapy. You can imagine a healthy expression of feelings, but drop it in the hands of psychiatry, and they'll ooze around it, and crush it, and dole it out in meager portions until it's nothing more than a meaningless series of commands. One more compliance test in a series of millions. Did I mention there's waterboarding in this episode? Yeah, I'm not sure how they snuck that one into a children's cartoon. Anyway, Kevin hatches a plan to bust his brothers out. Hmm, where have I seen that before? He succeeds in the prison break and manages to snap them out of their programming because, again, fun serial children's cartoon, no lasting trauma. That apparently wasn't enough, though. They had to solve the mom knows about the inventions problem in order to get a full reset. So it turns out the whole episode was a dream. Oh, hey, did you notice how I foreshadowed that with the Inception music? I, I, I thought it was clever, I'm sorry. But it doesn't end there. In another twist, the whole thing was Perry dreaming about Kevin dreaming, which doesn't even make sense. Like, how would Perry know about the talking zebra? There's so much padding at the end that the whole prison thing winds up losing focus in favor of wacky bait-and-switch gags with no significance to the earlier plot. Like the sudden recovery in Futurama, Phineas and Ferb get busted, pulls away when things get too heavy. I can't tell if the padding is there to stretch a 20 minute story into the full 22, because it also feels like emotional padding to intentionally lessen the impact. On reflection, I don't know which message is more dangerous. That confinement in a psychiatric prison is no big deal because it has no lasting consequence, or that you just don't have to worry about it because it would never really happen. American Fung is a 2015 episode of Republican satire American Dad, Season 10, Episode 17. This is the most recent episode we're going to cover today, and appropriately to our theme of personal history, the most... adult? I hesitate to call anything from the mind of Seth MacFarlane mature, but at times it does get pretty dark, pretty serious, not very stylized, and just presenting the real world. The story goes that husband-father CIA agent Staniel Smith forgets his marriage anniversary with Francine and hatches a plan to buy himself time by getting her locked up in a psychiatric jail. It's a shame your wife is of sound mind, because if she were to be kept in a mental institution, it could buy you some much-needed anniversary planning time. Wait a minute. We can just accuse Francine of being crazy and get her locked up on a 72-hour psych hold! Also, a Chinese billionaire has purchased the show. It's racist and has nothing to do with the main plot, so that's all we're gonna say about it! Unlike HAL Institute, or the Smile Away Reformatory, this jail is simply titled Fairfax County Psychiatric Hospital. There's no joke there. When Stan comes to pick up Francine, she figures out that he orchestrated the whole thing and straight up says, I hate you. Like I said, this fluffy cartoon comedy gets pretty dark. As in the previous two examples, the jail causes more problems than it solves. The major difference here is that the writers seem more interested in, rightly, blaming the guy who sent her there who won't acknowledge that he did anything wrong. The doctors almost seem reasonable by comparison. You seem to be Francine's trigger. Finally realizing his responsibility in creating the situation, at least momentarily, Stan vows to break Francine out. Why does everyone think the most interesting plot for a prison setting is to not be in the prison anymore? Okay, in this case, the breakout is a failure. Stan and Francine wake up in an operating room, Stan gets a lobotomy, and the episode ends. And by ends, I mean goes back to the Chinese billionaire stuff for another three minutes and then ends. I think the lesson here, at least what I personally took away from it, 
is that the world tries to paint over the bad stuff with jokes and apathy, but the bad stuff still happened. It's sort of like cabaret, but condensed into a 20-minute cartoon. We can decide not to focus on what happened and pretend everything's okay, but that doesn't mean we don't remember it. The transitions between the episode's two plots are very abrupt, and while I don't have any faith in the show writers doing that with purpose, what I got from it was a theme of distraction. Every time the mental health stuff gets a little too real, we pull back to a joke about product placement or some diet racism. Yeah, yeah, there's atrocities happening to innocent people every moment of every day, but don't think about that. Like its predecessors, American Fung does a decent job depicting the reality of psychiatric incarceration, but doesn't have the balls to commit the entire episode to it, nor to follow through in its conclusion. There's important lessons to be found in the cracks, but it could have done more. And that brings us back to the present. Back to sobering adulthood. Sorry to say, not a lot of cultural progress has been made in this time. The most optimistic thing I could say is that people are more willing to share their labels. Like, when someone says they're depressed, we don't instantly think lazy. We don't assume a multiple system is going to kill us. There's less stigma, I guess. But at the same time, we have organizations like NAMI calling to end the stigma against locking people up and forcing drugs on them. I set out to find stories about psychiatric incarceration, and I had to cast a net 14 years wide in order to find three examples, all three of which miss the point in some way and conclude on irrelevant distractions. Our society really doesn't want to talk about this stuff, at least not the ugly parts. It's easy enough to find a respected politician or conference keynote or news anchor euphemistically calling for services to remove scary mental illness from public view. It's nearly impossible to find one talking in terms of human rights. At the end of these three stories, I feel as if I just heard the same story three times. Innocent neurotypical is wrongly convicted, as if declaring a person mentally ill could ever be rightful conviction. Horrible stuff happens to them, as it would in any prison. Someone tries a breakout to rescue them from these awful conditions. You'd think healing from trauma would come next, but no, never mind, everything's fine. Don't worry your pretty little head about it. The stories we grow up with as children have the potential to inspire us, to open up new horizons, and to teach us important life lessons. But in order for a story to do anything, someone has to write it. Animation may seem magical, but writers are not, they're just people. They've grown up with the same cultural biases that others around them have shared. When a writer isn't conscious of that, when they think their value judgments are just facts, the same bias and judgment seeps into their work. The life lesson we get from watching is to hold the view that the writer thinks everyone should hold. I definitely don't believe we can blame all the Zanism in the world on a few 20-minute cartoon episodes, but they haven't done much to challenge it either. Because they didn't want to, because their creators didn't think it was important. In my mind, I can picture animators right now crafting stories to teach their children not to be scared of Muslims or immigrants or trans people. But madness? Sorry. You'll just have to wait your turn. I'm not sure how we went from wondrous children's inspiration to ice-cold cynicism. I swear I didn't plan that. Hey there, all you girls, boys, and little envy joys. I want to thank you for lending me your time and your listening ear. Or maybe your eyes? Oh yeah, shout out to my deaf peeps! I also want to thank Mikey Newman at FilmJoy for starting this whole animation, personal story, community series thing. And also in general, showing me how it's possible to analyze something you like and be both insightful and entertaining. Well, I think I am! As always, I gotta ask for a like and subscribe, or else the company hosting this video will send me a wellness check. And tell me in the comments what my next video should be about. 
Is this the part where the video actually ends? Yes. Yes, it is.